Hey, that's pretty bad. 96 to 88, the Raptors lose to the Brooklyn Nets, who were on a six-game losing streak coming into this, and the Raptors are now on an 11-game losing streak. A lot of interesting inflection points here. You know, you get a couple fun performances, particularly from like Javon Freeman Liberty, I think has a really nice stretch where his driving pushes the Raptors forward to eventually take the lead in this game, which would they they would eventually lose. There's a couple like rag take performances. There's some fun runs that have been made. But here's the big thing. The Raptors lose at the end of it to lose their 11th straight. And there is kind of a cloud over the top of this game, especially when we think about, you know, the overall direction of the league, how it's being affected. And also like how closely tied and entangled everything is to gambling now and the expected fallout of that. I think that for a lot of people who were wondering about how that might look, you could have looked to England as kind of a, you know, a bit of a prediction because they introduced sports betting, you know, and le- le- the legality of it and kind of intermingling it with the sports that people bet on and kind of like endorsing it fully across so many things. And honestly, like England is dealing with a lot of difficulties about that too. I like, I see what's, what's right there. Like Raptors Republic made a deal. I get it. But honestly, that's, that's where it is. Um, the Raptors, I think it was like, there's not a lot of great basketball being played and you, you do have to resign yourself that you're watching a different type of basketball when you tune into the Raptors. Now, this isn't, you know, the, the championship Raptors. This isn't the super competitive Raptors. These are, you know, young hopefuls, G leaguers, two way players, 10 dayers, and a couple like role players stitching everything together. And like the the most consistent performers game to game are Kelly Olenek and Gary Trent Jr. And Gary Trent Jr., as far as like a Raptor, anybody who's been watching the team for the past few years knows that he wasn't considered the most consistent as far as like impact. Is he was like maybe six or seven in terms of like consistent impact on the Raptors when they were at the height of let's say the Pascal and Fred era. And now he's the number one guy. You know, Grady, as much as I love watching Grady and there's like a ton of fun stuff and interesting stuff to see him do, he went 0 for 5 tonight. He was 3 for like 0 for 5 from downtown, 3 for 11 across the whole game. Like he did some interesting stuff. He always will. But, you know, Ochai Baji is taking 11 shots. You know, he's he's cutting within the framework of the offense. The Raptors are running their offense and they needed that extra punch the 15 points from Javon, 7 of 12 from the field. They needed it bad. And so it's an a, it's not a very talented team that plays in scheme. And on a night where they lose their 11th game in a row, they also happen to set the franchise record for most assists ever in a season, which is, of course, impacted by, you know, faster pace of play, which is impacted by scoring being up across everything, but also... It is a nod and an endorsement of what Darko has wanted to do since coming in, change the overall shape of the offense, be able to get more out of mid-tier players, lower-end players, role players, by making sure that less of it relies on ball handling and some of that can rely on quick decision-making and cutting. He has gotten more out of them in that regard. The tough thing now is just like, the team isn't very good. We're watching a bad basketball team now. The Jonte Porter thing is my awareness of Jonte Porter before this is just mostly good things. I knew he was kind of like an investment bro. Like not, and this isn't like a, a declaration of what he gets up to, but kind of a guy like that would have been perusing Reddit on like Wall Street bets type thing, right? Like he he's into it. He has, he, as far as I know, a secondary account dedicated to like talking about betting crypto he's into that scene where it's like make your money make money and you know doing it through more radical means let's say now does any of that really matter if he's not guilty of it of course not it's just a unique approach to making money and one that you know he's really into as far as like the oddity of him leaving games early, there being like a lot of people trying to bet on his unders 
during that time, everything coalescing into this is tough. It's a tough look. Darko was asked about it after the game. He said he had no comment. Obviously, because how could you possibly? The coach isn't going to know anything. The coach is going to learn about a lot of this stuff at a similar time. Like, Woj breaks news for coaches and players all the time. And I think that's what happened today. Obviously, you know, Jonte isn't going to play until this is sorted out. Uh, Garrett Temple said, like, you know, they back him until proven otherwise. That's the teammate. I think that makes sense from their standpoint as well. The play, like, I I really would doubt if Jonte was guilty of it, that he was, like, telling the guys, you know, I've got this great scam I'm running. Could he be innocent? Totally. There, There's a lot of room for that. However, it would just be, like, incredibly odd for that betting market behavior to happen without any like insider knowledge or whatever just to see it kind of like the having those things combined is odd now i don't know how they prove this kind of stuff i don't know how you know i i don't know how aggressive they go into these investigations but if jonte is proven guilty of this this is like a significant step back for the league it undermines com- like the competitive nature of the game. It undermines the integrity of the game. And you'd have to imagine they would make like a significant example out of him. And, you know, that's the thing about like accusations that get reported on in the public eye and all that kind of stuff is like, e- even if they can't prove it, even if they can't do whatever, even if he is innocent, like this will be linked to him for like a super long time. And every time... Like, if he's innocent, then it's going to suck really bad for him because the NBA doesn't just get to conduct this investigation. They have the tweet go out that they are conducting the investigation. He gets pulled out of the games. And even if he's declared innocent, every time he misses a shot for, like, years, every time he's injured, every time anything happens to him, there will be speculation that he's on the take. It is, like, a super gross situation. And that's kind of what you get when you're mixing like gambling is a vice and mixing that with, you know, so closely and having it endorsed everywhere, you know, you're going to end up with this kind of stuff. We've seen it in soccer overseas. We've seen it in the NFL. Not exactly the same, but it's something that's going to happen. And it's presumably happening more than we know. Now, that doesn't have to mean it's exponential, just that there's probably a few cases that they're really clever about, that they're really smart about, and that they don't get caught. I get it. But yeah, this is it's part of the outcome. Now, of course, since this is illegal, like what, what he's doing is not allowed anyway, you could say that this would happen regardless of anybody like making it accessible or whatever. It's just the fact that like betting is so accessible now. If the hypothetical, because I'm not, I don't want to defame anybody here. I don't want to slander anybody, right? Um, the hypothetical is that there's insider information from Jonte. Jonte is on the take, etc. Again, hypothetical, hypothetical, hypothetical. That information flows down to people who can make informed bets now. Those informed bets are really easy to make on the litany of betting places. There's a wide ranging cascading effects here. (laughs) And we just have to see what happens. That's as much as I, that's as comfortable. I don't feel comfortable going any further. I, there are people right now super sleuthing it. There are people right now looking for, you know, a collinearity, a collection of, you know, congruent behavior that points one way. I get it. I do. I'm not, there is an investigation that would, be better at that than I am. And these are the facts as I know them. And then obviously a hypothetical situation is the hypothetical situation. <sighs> Crazy Raptors season. Really, really odd. Um, 11 losses in a row. Franchise record for assists. I think this is the, lo- the longest losing streak they've had since like 2010 or 2011. New coach, Scotty takes a step towards stardom. He's he's had the best third year any Raptors have ever had in a 
you know, a third year, maybe he, he's starting to paint himself in the image of, you know, as Darko said, like a future face of the league. You know, some people think he's the next American MVP. All this stuff, these big, important things are happening, trending in the positive direction. This is kind of what we're seeing. And there's also a bunch of stuff like, you know, the tragedies that have struck the team as well, the personal matters that players have had to deal with. It's just like weird year of basketball in Toronto. And and so much so that you go to these games or I go to these games and I watch the team and you talk to the players and you talk to the guys and it's just like everyone feels it, the weight of like, it's not good right now. And and credit to the guys who can remain upbeat. And, you know, I think that kind of, it kind of helps not to have, you know, because who feels it more like? Pascal Siakam last year as he's looking at a team that he's like, man, we really should be, you know, we really should be winning like 47, 48 games or something like that. And we're looking at the plan and we lose to the Bulls, you know, and, and it's just like go one for three down the line from the free throw line. That's tough. You know, Fred can't beat Vooch on switches. That's tough. It's just like you're underperforming, whereas now the team is made up right now by a lot of like journeymen or people who are trying to get into into the league through the back door. And so, you know, it's I think those guys having like those aspirations and like that incentive to perform and like always put on and they do it within the context of the team, the structure of the scheme, I think is good. I think it's helpful. From too legit to Raptors, quote, I just find it disingenuous. The NBA is going to ban him if guilty while promoting gambling left, right and center. A lot of these guys are in their 20s, end quote. I do not find it disingenuous for Jonte. I would find it disingenuous if Jonte was like gambling and had a gambling problem with something that he couldn't affect, right? This isn't about gambling specifically. Gambling is bad. Gambling is a vice. Everybody knows gambling is bad. It is, however, right now, like the major cash cow for sports. And, you know, they lobbied to get to this point. They like, this was something in the States that happened so much. And there's like great videos done on it, but like they lobbied to get to this point and they did it through the, the lens of like, um, what's it called? Fan fantasy sports, right? A skill game, they called it. And they use it to lobby to, be able to kind of introduce more money into it. And then once people see how much money is in it and there's that profit motive there, they see like money, okay, there's business interest, okay, there's taxation opportunities, there's all this kind of stuff. And who's bearing the brunt of that is, you know, the 20% of gamblers that represent, well, not 20%, but the portion of gamblers that represent problem gamblers is the term they use, gambling addicts, the whales who, you know, these companies make all the money off of. So there's like a lot of money and sports dove headfirst into it. And, you know, this was co-signed by governments who legalized it, this, all this kind of stuff. Right. And that's so if Jonte had a gambling problem, I think it would be like disingenuous of the NBA to say like, oh, you can't do that. But the, the exact problem here is that he has a tangible effect on what the gambling is involving which is a completely different conversation every most people who listen to me know my stance on gambling know my stance on this kind of stuff but as far as like there is a big difference between the and while i don't agree with it and while like it's i don't like the way that the industry has gone either i don't like the way that like society is trending in general towards everything is like profit 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 that isn't congruent for a, like a healthy society not everything that profits is good for people type thing. Um, to see, the NBA endorses so much of it, but they do not endorse like cheating it. You know, <laughs> that's that's the thing. The NBA doesn't endorse cheating it. And it, the reason why it would be so crazy and the what the, the clear allegation and investigation into it is that like Jonte is the sole, like he controls for the outcome of this bet overs team context all this kind of stuff definitely can affect it of course because are you going to get the ball enough is your coach going to play you enough no but if you tell people to slam the under 
and you control the under and all of a sudden you're out of those games that's not that's not gambling right and that's not the same well i don't agree with it that's not the same as the nba endorsing gambling that's not the you know the fan duel logo on the baseline for the first half of the season for the raptors that's not the poker stars casino you know thing on the baseline that's on the raptors court right now those are two different things and i'm not saying good one good one bad but they are different so disingenuous i'm not sure but this is like there's a reason these are really bad um allegations obviously <laughs> Uh, SSLP4621 says, Hey, Samson, which role players do you see being brought back next season? Gary, Jalen, Ochai, Jalen, Chris, etc. Love the show. Great late night viewing here in England. Hey, um, cool. In England, you probably are aware of the, the sports betting effect over there more so than we are here since it's been going live for you know a few more years at the very least now. Um, who do I think is interesting for next year? I do really wonder about like, the Gary Jordan Grady of it all. And I wrote about this, I think, I can't remember if it was like late January or late February. The whole season is melding into one big pot of craziness. But I do think it is interesting, like Gary represents a veteran presence on the team and represents like a really good shooter. I know tonight wasn't his best night shooting it, but he can very, like he can do that and he can provide ball pressure. Some games you're going to get like, really impressive off the dribble shot making some games you're going to get like way too many gambles on defense and some games you can get like a good defensive performance that creates real defensive be really bad but he's mostly going to shoot the basketball and he has things he's not good at there's like what he wants to get paid what the raptors want to pay him and that middle ground that fits you know the raptors timeline etc and then Gary can meet that, meet where they're comfortable at if his market isn't as, you know, hefty as he might want it to be, which is the exact reason why he didn't take the, um, why he didn't take the, or why he took the the player offer, right? The 18.5 million, the player option, I should say. So that really depends and that really will affect Jordan Wara. Jordan War, I think, is a an opportunity for the Raptors if Gary gets a little bit pricey for them to just like punt on it and say, well, OK, Jordan is the gunner. Hopefully Grady overtakes him or just like starts. And if Grady's having a rough stretch, then Jordan comes in and can operate in that lane. Grady, you know, as much as he's getting so much playing time towards the end of the season, uh, he, he has good games and he has really bad games. Like tonight, like Grady is not having a positive impact on the floor. And I don't blame him. Like he's young. He's clearly going to be very good. I like his game a lot. But like this is a really bad game. If the team was good. And like actually I did like his defense tonight for what it's worth. There's some good defensive stuff. Um, beating guys to spots. Good rotations. Clean switches. All that kind of stuff. But if the team was good and Gary goes 3 for 11 and 0 for 5 from 3. We're all kind of like. Damn, if Scotty was still healthy, Jakob's still healthy, and these guys are making some sort of like, you know, late season push for the play in tournament, and people want to see that. I know some people are team tank, of course, but like a Grady performance like this would be like, damn, if only we had someone consistent. And Grady will chase that consistency. And I think the big conversation point is that, like, is that stop gap going to be Gary, who's going to be more expensive, but more dependable than Jordan, probably? Or is it going to be Jordan, who's going to be more affordable? And I have no intel on what the Raptors plan to do. I just know that, like, obviously, the two, Gary and the Raptors, came together to discuss an extension. They were too far apart on it. The guards and, like, combo guards, extension talks around the league, there's been big... Because combo guards and guards got paid like two years ago, three years ago. They kept getting the bag. A lot of money went out to those guys. RJ Barrett was part of that, of course. Jordan Poole was part of that. Um, people are pretty apprehensive about that currently. And Malik Monk is probably going to be top dog there in the summer. So Gary's market 
is kind of interesting. Nesta asks, have I gotten to the Jonte news? Yeah, I talked about it probably for like 10 minutes. And then I guess just gambling for like maybe three or four specifically. Um, from And then, okay. Ochai, I love if he shoots the basketball. If he shoots the basketball, great. If he doesn't shoot it, like he's swing skill, that's really it. That's what decides whether he sticks in the NBA or not. That's what that's what it is. And maybe he will be a guy who like has like a Euro League thing because he's going to be athletic for a long time. He's going to provide good defense for a long time. And I've liked what I've seen on that end. And there's a reason he gets a lot of the premier matchups night to night. Um, as far as like Ochai, he has to hit threes. If he doesn't hit threes, as much as he is like a proactive cutter, as much as he is like a defender, he just he won't be able to stick on a team that presumably next year will be trying to win games, especially if they if they don't have their pick right. <laughs> and we'll we'll see how that works out with the with the lottery and everything like that. I mean, the Raptors are losing every game. You know, Nesta asks. Can Ochai have a Tony Allen type role as his best way to stick in the league? And Micah Zion says, Ochai really reminds me of Champagny. Yeah. I I watched a lot of Champagny. I don't know if you mean, you probably mean Justin, not Julian. Um, I don't know if he reminds me very much of Justin, but that's an interesting thought. And then can Ochai have a Tony Allen type role as his best way to stick in the league? I don't think so. This spacing, passive spacing, gravity, you know, really being efficient in how you space the floor and how like the fourth most important guy plays into offensive sets these days. It's, it's really tough for that Tony Allen mold to make it work in the NBA now. And it just is because like teams are much better now of getting the Tony Allen defender off of like, if you're the primary in 2009, Tony Allen is lighting it up. He's sticking a guy all game. Teams now are much better at skirting the primary defender, getting a switch or losing him by a screens. Stars work harder off ball to get loose. Stars run more off ball screens. The primary like sticky defender is not as important now as it might have been back then. Teams defend a little bit more in scheme now across a bunch of different players. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Fred Van Vliet could be like a Hellcat guarding Steph Curry because there was such a great hub of defenders behind him who are playing in scheme team defense. I don't, um, I don't know if the Tony Allen archetype is a strong foothold for a player in the league. Now, Oh, just has to shoot the three. That's what it is. He's got NBA skills 100% and was drafted in the lottery because people thought one of his great skills would be a three point shot. You, you look at the shot charts, you look at like the percentages at Kansas, he was lighting it up. Shots a little flat now. You know, I, I was talking to some friends who said they thought there was a hitch in, in the shot and that, you know, it, it might look a little different from time to time. They might be looking at it with a closer eye than I, I do because I'm not necessarily seeing the same thing, but I do see a flat jumper. I do see a jumper that misses a lot. And I guess we're just seeing, and he really needs to turn that around. And then just to finally like, um, Jalen McDaniels, um, I wasn't super big on. I know Trey had watched him in, you know, in Charlotte, and then he had like a good, you know, handful of games with Philly. But I was like, we'll see about the shot, man, because people called him a shooter right away. And Chris, Chris, if the Raptors plan on being like a play-in type team next year or going forward, I think Chris can be part of that rotation. I really do. I mean. Godspeed to his recovery and everything like that. But like Chris is allergic to not trying. And effort is, you know, very important in the NBA. Effort and length. He gives it as much as he can for as long as he can. So I don't know what's going to be the situation with Chris in the summer, but I'd love to cover Chris. I'd love to see him on the team next year. That's mostly what I think about that. And then Nesta asks, how redundant are Bruce and Ochai in that case? Well, I think Ochai is much better on defense currently. I've seen Bruce have very strong defensive stretches, of course. Bruce has had way higher highs than Ochai. Bruce has had higher highs than, like, Gary. Bruce was putting, like, hitting 20 in the finals. Pull-up threes was, like, just incredibly important to 
you know, Denver's championship run, all that kind of stuff. There's nobody on this team, Kelly, Gary, Wara, who also is a, you know, a champion. Nobody on this team has reached a higher high, I don't think, than Bruce has. But Bruce is not giving it his all. And even, even in Indiana, like Caitlin Cooper told me when he first got traded here, well, the defense is not exactly where it was. And it's been different. And with the, like his, he's just, he's been inefficient on drives. There's been like a ton of catch and hold stuff. His defense hasn't been good. And I don't mean that as like, oh, Bruce Brown can't play. He's trash. No, like obviously not. I mean, Bruce Brown is a really talented player. He's just not bringing it every night the same way he same way he has in the past. And then also, he doesn't get to play off of superstars right now. He played off of Kyrie, James Harden, Kevin Durant, and Jokic, you know? And, and like, you know, too legit, two Raptors says, people forget Bruce was in the closing lineup in Game 5 last year to clinch the chip. That being said, he is overrated. Yeah, it's, I think some people, like, he's he's a very good player. And it could be that like some of his impact metrics and some of the stuff he's really strong at, it is necessary for him to be tied to a really, really strong offensive talent. That could be true. And and does the perception of his impact become kind of like, you know, inflated and then deflated once he's away from that? Sure. I bet he recoups a lot of like the the public favor once he plays next to a star again. Is that star Scotty Barnes? I don't know. I don't know if he'll be here next year. I guess we'll see. But yeah, Music Deli says, <laughs> I bet the over on YouTube likes this Samson stream will get. I don't even know what it's set at. But yeah, while everyone's in here, um, uh, like the video because that helps uh, push it in the algorithm, etc. Nesta says, only in sports can guys have such a low output and not have any repercussions. I couldn't get away with that at work. Yeah, I sometimes I do think about this. And then, but I like the structure of the NBA because like, and I've always loved this because it, it's called, you know, it's the CBA and it seems quite socialist in nature, right? Um, the reason why the minimum contract is so high is because, um, is because like LeBron James, as far as his worth to the team in a salary cap sport, he's worth like $180 million a year or maybe even more. And he makes what, like 49, 50. And so that means that, you know, you get to the guys at the bottom get to make more. And then also, like, like you say, Nesta, you couldn't get away with something at work. What I see is not, not necessarily that perspective. I think like, I wish that regular working people could get away with stuff because the reason why players are like NBA players in particular, especially in relative to like NFL players or something, why they're so secure is because they leverage their labor power for that security, which I think is great, you know, and of course it's sports. So it's not as high stakes, you know, I know with your job, maybe you screw something up. Maybe there's some like some nasty, nasty side effects for somebody. My job is also not super high stakes either. Um, but like, you know, I've done high stakes work before and yeah, obviously you want people with high stakes work to do a very good job all the time. But I do, I do like that, you know, the NBA, the players are well protected. I love that they have labor power. I hope, you know, I, I just hope that extends to other workplaces across the world. And I hope that when there's an opportunity for like coalition building and the NBA union has like some sort of opportunity to help out the little guys. I hope that their like class consciousness leads towards like unions instead of like tax brackets. That's uh, that's kind of like uh, that's where I think Nesta says as a huge voice and supporter for labor. Have you taken a look into the monopoly of the UFC? Their athletes are getting screwed. CBAs are vital for equity. Yeah, um, I haven't looked into this. I've only read about this like sparingly and heard about it. But I, you just hear horror stories about like protection in, in the UFC and, and combat sports, right? I'm not a big combat sport. I know you are. I know a lot of people love combat sports. Like a leg loves combat sports. Um, it's it's tough watch for me. I know like I just fought one. I had a big dent in my head. But I was, uh, I was at uh, an obstacle course and I just, boom, 
Yeah, nasty business. Um, Alex Stockton says, did you already talk about the 10-day decision yet, Samson? Yeah, uh, Jemias, I know some people really liked him. I saw Eric Kareem tweeted out that he was like, he would bet his career that Jemias Ramsey is like an NBA-level player, which, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm as certain, but I, I like Eric, and I like that he's like willing to voice that. I think that makes me more likely to like look deeper into Jemias. Um, Jim, when asked, Darko said he could see Jemias as part of the Raptors organization in the future. Savannah Hamilton asked him about that. I don't know if that means like a summer league situation. I don't know if that means he's competing, you know, next season in the training camp or whatever. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if that's like an easy out for Darko. Who knows? Um, Jemias, I thought the defense was the best aspect of his game while he was a Raptor. And like, there was some good stuff there, uh, especially across the top of the defense. I was like, hmm, some good movement. And, um, Kobe Simmons, I know Kobe Simmons has a lot of fans in the Raptors organization. He's a person people really like, and he's a, a player who obviously I think it was like 36 or 38 games. He's played across four different teams at the NBA level. He he's they're looking for him to make some reads out of like the DHO Chicago delay action stuff and see if anything pops off. But and truthfully, I haven't seen as much Kobe as, you know, like Cody Wiles would have or like Zolfi or like a bunch of the people, you know, Raptors Republic who spend more time doing 905 stuff. And, you know, they might have some stuff written on him in the coming days. But I guess we'll I guess we'll see. Um, Nesta, you talk about 12 to 18 percent of revenue that sucks for UFC fighters. Wow. Um, and obviously that would it skews very high for a few of them and then really low for others. Um, 12 to 18 sucks. Jeez. Um, and then, yeah, obviously it scales up the more money or viable uh, the business is. So I don't really know the exact, but 12 to 18 sounds extremely low. And then Ramsey did a great job against Bancaro despite the side size difference on his effort. Yeah. Jemias is gritty. He was grittier than I thought. Um, a lot of G League guys, especially guys who like play the guard position, it can be really gritty or it can be not so much. You know, they can really, there can be a lot of flash for some guys. And some guys can really be just like that, that grinder. And, and he had a pretty unique mix of both of them. But yeah, the, the defense popped to me the most. Um, he could play on this team right now. Jemias, like if it's, if it's about, you know, just like, did you do enough? Are you playing at the level that this team expects or needs? I think he did, but also what the 10 day is at this point of the season is you're filtering through guys looking for the perfect mix. If you can find it, you know, and sometimes like you don't. Sometimes you just filter through guys and none of them stick. Sometimes some of those guys go on to stick elsewhere and have nice careers, you know, but the Raptors are probably just trying to get as many guys in house as possible to get a few different looks at guys. And they might even feel a little bit of like loyalty to a 905 guy to give them that opportunity as well. Like it, like it might be meaningful that they're like, Hey, we saw a lot of Kobe. We really like what you did with the, you know, the 905, like come on up. That there's always that kind those kind of considerations. Um Kobe has not played a better game than Jemias' best game as a Raptor yet. He will have opportunities to. And I thought Kobe was all right tonight. I think that there were like some passing reads that he missed. I think that there's like it's tough to find the aggressiveness threshold on ball when you're stepping into all this kind of stuff. So that's it's and obviously I have the bird's eye well, not bird's eye view technically, but like the lower bowl view, which means I can see passing lanes better than someone can at court level. So it's tough. That's those are the best passers. Good passers make the same read as like the audience can see, especially camera audience, right? Like TV audience, because you see the whole court, you know who's open. The great passers are the ones who can make in their sleep the camera pass and can also like out see the audience. That's like Trey Young does it all the time. I love how Trey Young, Young passes because like he'll he'll beat the audience and I'll be like, 
Oh, where did that pass come from? Scotty does as well. There's a lot of like same side stuff where Scotty will see a defense shifting, you know, back to like protecting the weak side because he's going there. And you'll just see the, like this push pass directly under the rim. And you're like, damn, you got me. It's pretty good. Um, yeah. Music Deli says the NBA CBA is obviously very strong, but the 14, 15 spots are fairly precarious. So I'm all for those players getting guaranteed money when they can. Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah. I mean, the players just get get paid as much as you can. Once you're rich, then start considering other stuff. And if once you're rich, you also you start considering generational wealth, whatever, Godspeed. That's that's what it is. There's very little exploitation done by like NBA players in terms of like how they get their profits. And so just go earn, baby. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is an entertainment product. You are the entertainment. You hold the power. Leverage it as best you can. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. That's the game, though. I think that's the podcast. We got, what, 36 minutes out of it? Can I just say one sec? Huge thank you to Kai for doing the Wizards game. He went for 57 minutes. The first podcast I ever did on my own, I did like 15, and it killed me. It was so difficult. It is tough to monologue just nonstop. It's it's not easy. And he came out here, and he did a fantastic job. So thank you to Kai. And Yosef Cassidy says, all caps, he did great too. He did. Big shout out. If if ever I'm not doing this podcast anymore, um, I I my recommendation would be Kai for sure. Uh, he's a natural. He's got the New York accent too. You know, he's got some sauce to him. Yeah. So big thank you to Kai. But um, yeah, Alex Stockton says I will always feel sympathetic for the ten day guys as they are so close to making the cut or losing their one shot. Yeah, it's. It pays well relative to regular work over the course of the 10 days. It certainly does. Um, I And you hope they keep getting paid well. But it's a tough, I think it would be tough mentally to be on the outside trying to fight your way in. You know, it's a bit of a meme now, especially with what happened today. The bet on yourself stuff that Fred, you know, it's the dice, the dice man. But and he talks about like how hard mentally he had to be to kind of like get in the back door of the league and it's true it's not easy you got to be a grinder and you gotta be tough because you're going to see setbacks you're really going to see setbacks also for draft pick watchers indiana is up 16 against the clippers so maybe not uh not it won't keep cascading down but anyway that feels like a podcast yeah all right Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Much love. And, uh, yeah, Raptors lose. We'll be back here Wednesday after a New York game, which is not as fun now because OG probably won't be there either. I guess we'll see. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Whether you got into this in the morning or at night. That's right, Nesta. One love. Uh, Yeah. And uh, goodbye. (laughs)